we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome, everybody, to the Fairbanks Ethics Lecture Series. Um, I'm Joan Hazy. I'm one of the uh, co-directors of the Respect Center that we kind of coordinate some of the, the uh, lecture series for the Fairbanks Center, and just so thrilled to be able to do that. This lecture is uh, being recorded and broadcasted, uh, so thank you to those joining us at IU Health North and at IU Health Arnett and IU Health Ball Memorial. So you didn't know you had all those people listening to you as well. Um, ask you to please silence all your cell phones and pagers, and please leave the auditorium to return any phone calls that you may get. It is my great um, pleasure to be able to introduce a very wonderful friend and, and incredible scholar, uh, Dr. Susan McMillan. She's a distinguished university professor at the Lyle and Beatrice Thompson professor. She's a, the Lyle and Beatrice Thompson professor in oncology, quality of life nursing. Wow, that's a mouthful, Susan. Uh, <laughs> at the University of South. Florida, where she coordinates the oncology nursing program in the master's and the doctoral programs. Her major areas of research have been in system assessment and management in persons with cancer and quality of life of hospice patients with cancer and their family caregivers. To give you just a little bit of a sense of the extent of her accomplishments by numbers, not a numbers person, but I, hers were amazing, she has supported her research with an external funding of over $11 million has over 101 referee, journals plus, uh, referee publications in journals, plus numerous book chapters and invited papers. She has shared her no knowledge by mentoring throughout her career, having chaired, get this guys, 95 theses and served on 31 dissertation committees. Now you're tired of the rest of us are too. Dr. McMillan's PhD is in measurement, and she has developed several clinically relevant assessment tools, including the Hospice Quality of Life Index, the Caregiver Quality of Life Index, and the Constipation Assessment Scale, among others. All of these have been used widely in this country and have been translated for use in other countries. Dr. McMillan princi is principal investigator on a clinical trials focusing on self-care symptoms management for patients with cancer that's funded by the court. <laughs> I'm really not all that special. I just have been doing it a long time. <clears throat> so when I come north, I always make sure I have a palm tree on my first slide just to rub it in that I live in Florida, and you don't. <laughs> and wait about a month. It'll mean a lot more to you then than it does now. <laughs> so the first question is, how do we define palliative care? Because I work in the area of palliative care, and, and it's very obvious to me that there are a variety of definitions out there, so I'm going to give you mine before we get started. Uh, for a lot of people, it only means end-of-life care, and it does not mean that for me. So that's why I want to make sure you know what, what I'm talking about. So this is not new. It's from the World Health Organization. And the World Health Organization in 1990 said, in this country, when we talk about um, palliative care, we talk about curative care all the way through, and then we say, oh, we can't cure them. Then we start palliative care. And that that is not the trajectory we should be working on, but instead it should look like this, that from the moment they're diagnosed, they have symptoms. I mean, we do things to them make them sick. <laughs> we give them pain. We give them nausea. We give them all kinds of problems. Um, and so we need to start, as they need it, we need to start uh, upping the palliative care. And it may be more palliative care and less curative care near the end but, uh, as we get close to death. And this is what it should look like. I was uh, thinking about this recently, and I thought, actually, can you see this cursor? I'm thinking that it probably should be some up and down jags in here. I just can't figure out how to draw that in the, the drawing. But if I figure that out, that's what my next slide is going to look like. So I'm going to talk to you today about uh, an intervention we've been using successfully with uh, cancer caregivers, and we're now applying it to cancer patients. So uh, it's the COPE intervention, and it was developed by a psychologist. I know there's some psychologists in the room because I see you. Uh, Peter Houts, who uh, was at Penn State. He's now emeritus from there and Julia Butcher, who's a nurse. Uh, it was published by the American Cancer Society, and I always put their website on because I thought they would be ACS.org because everybody calls them ACS, but if you go put in ACS.org, you get the American Chemical Society, which most of us don't want. So they have published it, and now it's in its second edition, and you can find it on the website. It's, I don't know, $12, $15, something like that, so it's not bad. So the whole book is available. It isn't mine. I don't own it. I want to make that clear. It is a problem-based coping intervention. It's to help people cope with uh, problems.
problems and symptoms and aimed at caregivers of, of patients with advanced cancer, which is we studied first. So it's based on the conceptual and research literature and problem solving training and, and then they took that and adapted it to the COPE model. So the purpose of COPE is to support family caregivers, some people call them informal caregivers, I call them family caregivers, and family of course we define very broadly, I'm sure all of you understand that, uh, of patients with advanced cancer. COPE stands for C, creativity, O, optimism, P, planning, and E, expert guidance. And I'm going to go through each of those with you because they have meaning, and that's the four-step sort of process. So creativity has to do with viewing problems from a, a new or creative perspective, Take, um, trying to find new strategies that are unique for this individual, this patient, this family, to, to solving them. So, for example, there's a school reunion coming up, and we know that he's going to have pain, and he's not going to want to go there and be in pain, and he won't enjoy it if he's in pain. So what can we do? Uh, to make him comfortable enough so that he can enjoy, enjoy all or part of it. What kind of steps can we take that will make this work for daddy? Uh, optimism um, has to do with having a positive but realistic attitude uh, toward the problem solving process. And it involves realistic optimism, not I'm going to be cured, everything's going to be fine, I'm never going to have symptoms again. And that's not what we mean by optimism, but really understanding um, what's going on and still having a hopeful attitude about it. And I think this is particularly important because we know, particular, particularly around pain, that frequently patients feel like it can't be managed. We see study after study where um, we go in and the pain is not being managed. They've got significant unmanaged pain. And you say, how satisfied are you with your pain management? And they say, oh, it's great. The nurses are just so great. And I've, I'm a nurse. I've been doing the getting the data. And I know they're not doing a great job. They're, they're giving them half of what they need while they continue to report pain. Well, why is that? It's because they don't believe it can be managed, and that is, seems to be pervasive, or there are other barriers. So we want them to believe that whatever the symptom is, that it can be managed. Um, planning means setting reasonable goals and thinking out in advance the steps that are going to be necessary. So we want that creativity and that optimism to come into this planning process. So again, there's an important uh, event coming up. I've got a bad problem with fatigue. How am I going to manage that? So rest ahead of time, maybe. Um, have someone else do the driving, take a nap in the car, uh, take breaks, maybe leave early so you can stop for breakfast along the way, then have a little rest before the event starts. So again, being creative about planning and being optimistic that this is going to work. And then expert information is a really important part of it. Um, the COPE guide gives them that expert information. And so uh, in our first study, we used a portion of it. Uh, in the current one, we're using a, an abbrevi uh, a modified complete one. Um, but it's what non-professionals need to know in order to manage symptoms. But we give them this and we train them in the COPE model, but we always say, now bear in mind that your primary care nurse or your hospice nurse or whoever's providing your care is your best source of information. So go there when you need information. And we even try to show them how to get that information. So here I gave you an example of what the subsections and the chapters look like. And they can look at this and get an overview. The idea is not that they read the whole guide, but they use it as a guide, as a reference book. So if, if they've got a problem with pain, they can read a paragraph or two about understanding the problem. And then when do they need to get professional help or when should they manage it themselves? And then this chapter has an extra one, which is when to get help for side effects of pain medication. And then what you can do to help. Now remember, this version of it is aimed at the caregiver. So what can, can the caregiver do uh, to help this problem? And then it also puts in some possible obstacles commonly expressed by patients. I'm afraid of addiction. I don't want to give him these drugs. I, I must save morphine until the pain is very severe. And we have lots of physicians who believe that. And of course, it's far from true. Uh, and only dying people take morphine. So how do you get past those kinds of barriers? And so some suggestions for how to get past them. And then always the last section is adjusting and carrying out your plan. So you've made a plan. You ran into some obstacles. You fix it. How do you adjust and then keep going with your plan? So every chapter is like this. So if they're having a problem with, I need to talk to the doctor about pain, but I don't know what to tell him, I don't know how to address the issue, then um, there's a uh, section in there about how do I talk to the doctor. So um, we've used COPE now in three clinical trials. And the first one we did uh, was between 2000 and 2005, supported by Na National Cancer Institute. Thank you very much for the money. Uh, we ended up with 329 patient caregiver dyads uh, in a hospice, one hospice. 
And the COPE had never been, had been published in 97 originally, but it had never been studied. And so we were the first group to study it. There's another group out there also using it. So I wanted you to see that we had uh, a very interdisciplinary group of study investigators um, with me as PI. Michael Weissner is a psychiatrist. And he actually brought the COPE intervention to the group um, and we adopted it. Ronald Schoenwetter is a geriatrician who is uh, in palliative care now. Uh, Bill Haley is a psychologist. Brent Small is our methodologist. And then at the bottom, two nurses. So we had a very interdisciplinary group, which made it a lot more fun. And it was a much richer experience because of that. So the purpose of our first clinical trial was to evaluate the effect of teaching this COPE for symptom management, because that's what it's focused on, uh, to caregivers of hospice patients with cancer. You know, could we have an impact on these caregivers? Now, I have always been a patient-focused person. Bill Haley, for example, is a caregiver-focused person. Michael Weissner is a caregiver-focused person. So we made a good team, but I wanted to see some patient outcomes. So it, it's very difficult to aim an intervention at hospice patients. They are so sick and so fragile that, I mean, how do you go in and teach them a skill? I mean, that would be not reasonable. And so I was hoping that by having an impact on the caregiver, we would have a secondary effect on the, uh, but you understand it's got to be diluted because it's going by way of the caregiver. In this first study, we looked at only three symptoms, and we looked at th symptoms that we knew were common, pain, dyspnea, and constipation. Now, she, you heard her say that <laughs> uh, I developed the constipation assessment scale. I didn't do that on purpose. I did it because there wasn't anything else out there to use at the time. Uh, and somehow, my name is forever linked with constipation. <laughs> People get a lot of laughs out of that at my expense. Uh, one of my research teams actually gave me a little blue plastic crown that had blue feathers on it, and on the front it said queen of constipation. So I, I'll never live it down. But of course we know if you treat pain, um, you cause constipation if you treat it with opioids. So our study was very feasible. One of the reasons I got into this, and I didn't mention our center, but I probably should since a center sponsored me to come here. We ha we, I am from the Center for Hospice Palliative Care and End of Life Studies at the University of South Florida. Talk about long titles. Um, and um, the thing that got me moving on doing this kind of research was I realized that we had some of the biggest hospices, not-for-profit hospices on the planet in our immediate area. And involved in our center were hospices that had 6,500 patients on any given day. I mean, that's a lot of patients. There was not another university on the planet, I thought, that had the kind of opportunity to answer questions about the needs of hospice patients and caregivers that we had. So doing studies in our area with hospice patients is very feasible. So as I said, 329 patient caregiver diets in this first study. We randomized them into three groups. Um, for patient inclusion, it was they had to be adults, they had to have cancer with two of our three target symptoms. I told you the three symptoms. They had to have a designated family caregiver, which is much easier in a hospice because the hospice has the patient tell them who is your caregiver. And so I didn't have to say, okay, you can be a caregiver and you can't. It was already determined. Um, they had to be able to read and understand English, and they, they had to pass uh, cognitive screening. Caregiver, adults providing care for at least four hours a day, no cancer. We didn't want them to be dealing with their own cancer diagnosis because, you know, if you're dealing with a, an older patient who has got cancer, odds are his wife has got some morbidities of her own, or if he's the caregiver, he's got some morbidities of his own. And so we didn't want it to be a cancer diagnosis that they were, because we didn't want to be teaching the caregiver how to take care of the patient and have the caregiver really turning that information back to self. Um, had to be able to read and understand English and be cognitively intact. Now we screened them and found that 2%, and, and we didn't, we only, we only admitted 329, but um, we screened many more than that. And 2% of all that we screened were uh, of the caregivers uh, could not pass cognitive screening. Now the, the caregivers are the ones who are giving information to the healthcare team or making decisions about the medicines and taking care of the patient. And I, that was sort of scary to me that, I mean, it was only 2%, but still, for every one of those patients, that was an issue. So we, of course, then did not include them in the study and referred back to the hospice and said, you have a problem with your caregiver and you need to check it out. One of the issues that we had, and I was telling the group earlier that we have done several methods papers because I think it's important for people to know how hard it is to do this kind of research. And it is really hard to do this kind of research and expensive. Um, but one of the things is accrual is very difficult, and uh, the, one of the biggest barriers was the caregivers. The caregivers very frequently refused. And 42% of them, which was the biggest number of them, said that they thought the patient was too sick. 
And initially, the clinicians were kind of puzzled by that because we said, well, you know, we very carefully screened them. We've looked at all of the parameters, and these are the right patients for our study. You know, what's wrong with the caregivers? And then it dawned on us, duh. We see sick people all the time. For the caregiver, this is the sickest person they've ever seen. How could we even dream of coming in and doing research? Well, about half the hospice nurses felt the same way, so uh, they didn't think the patient should be bothered uh, for data collection. But interestingly, the patients were very excited about being in the study, and sometimes the patient wanted to do it and the caregiver would refuse. And since we were looking at dyads, if the patient said yes and the caregiver said no, we lost the dyad. Um, and other research since then has supported that patients find meaning in research at the end of life because they see themselves as helping others that are coming after them. So anyway, um, so the uh, caregiver overwhelmed. I think probably if they had admitted it, more of them would have said that's the real reason because many of them really were overwhelmed by the experience, which was why we were trying to help them with the intervention. Uh, we used three measures. Uh, we tried to keep it as simple as possible because we were asking patients about their symptoms as well as uh, talking to caregivers. Um, so numeric rating scales for pain and dyspnea, and then my constipation assessment scale, which, by the way, I just got a translation into Japanese last week. It was kind of exciting. You know, when something you've done comes back in another language, you go, wow, that looks really weird, but it's nice. <laughs> so I've got it in Turkish and Arabic and Chinese and Japanese. It's, it's fun. Um, and then hospice quality of life. And then we, we're, we were using the memorial symptom assessment scale because we wanted to know what symptoms they had, how many of them had what symptom. And then if they had a symptom, so they had to check, 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 I have this symptom, how intense was it? How severe was that symptom? And then how much distress was it causing them? And then, of course, then a record data. So for the caregivers, uh, Michael Weitzner had developed the Caregiver Quality of Life Cancer Scale, and it had been validated, revalidated. He worked with me to revalidate it with hospice patients, so we used it. It's a very good scale. Um, and then we took the MSAS, which is designed for patients, and we gave it to the caregivers. We modified it, and we said, does your patient have these symptoms? And they checked, independent of the patient. They were in different rooms. Um, and then for the, for the symptoms they said the patient had, we said, how much distress does this cause you, the caregiver? Not how much distress is it causing the patient. How distressed are you by it? Because we were interested in the burden they were carrying. Because we knew our, our whole study was based on the idea that symptoms were stressors for caregivers. We were trying to look at how they coped. We didn't get much out of the brief cope, but we used the brief cope to look at whether they used problem-centered coping or emotion-focused coping, and uh, nothing about that changed in the demographics. So we wanted to get them at admission before the uh, care plan was in place, because we know as soon as patients get into hospice, things start changing for them almost immediately, particularly if they're having pain. But we discovered in earlier studies uh, the value of preliminary work um, that you cannot go in and admit somebody to a study the day they've been admitted to a hospice because the day they're admitted to a hospice, they're admitting that I'm not going to have curative care. This is the in, end of my disease process. Uh, this is it's a big thing. So you can't go in and say, now let me talk to you about this study. So we, we would go in 24 to 48 hours later, and if a weekend intervened, we would accept up to 72 hours. But the, the nurses there assured us that the care plan was not fully implemented for four days, and so that we were within that window of catching them at baseline. And then two weeks in at um, 30 days. And um, for future studies, we moved that up. Guess why? Guess what happened before 30 days? They either got a lot sicker or they died. Um, so we had a data collection team and an intervention team, and we had a nurse, a hospice nurse, and I, I hired the nurses through the hospice. I paid the hospice for the services of their nurses so that I had people that I knew could get in and out of homes and knew what they were doing. Um, and they collected the data from the caregivers, which was, of course, a lot more. And the hospice aides, the patients love the hospice home care aides. They love them. So they collected data from um, the patients. And then the intervention team, we had a hospice aide who stayed with the patient to relieve the mind of the caregiver. Caregivers are very attentive. We knew we could not get them away. We had experience. We couldn't get them away to come to a central site to get this intervention. We had to go to them in the home. Again, expensive. Um, but we also knew in the home they won't take their attention away from the patient long enough to attend to an intervention. So that's why we had the aid in there. And we tried to get them, if the house was uh, accessible to do it, we would have them in separate rooms so that while the intervention was going on, the patient was being cared for. And so the Hospice aides gave the kind of care they give anyway, which is respite care, supportive care, back rubs, going to the bathroom, reading, playing cards, whatever it might be. 
Um, and so this says standard care, but it was really usual care because there's nothing standard about care usually. Uh, and then we compared that to COPE. And then we had supportive visits in there as a, an attention control group. Uh, the attention control was to control for the time and attention. That is, the group, the COPE group might get better just because somebody spent time with them and they felt better because somebody cared about them. And so we, we wanted to spend that same kind of time but without teaching the COPE intervention. It was very hard for nurses not to do that, <laughs> not to go in, because they would say, what do I do about his pain? His pain is worse. And they, we gave them standard answers for what to say because they wanted to help and be nurses, and they couldn't in that situation. They had to just talk about their feelings about the patient and whatever. So that was the tough for them. And they, we uh, did it in three visits. Now, we wanted to finish up in nine days, and, and the reviewer said, why are you rushing through this? Guess why? Duh. They die. So we had to resubmit and explain. See, they're in hospice. They're there to die. We have to get this. If we're going to have any benefit at all, we have to speed it up a little bit. So was the intervention effective for caregivers? Was it effective for patients? Well, uh, we significantly decreased the caregiver's sense of burden. Uh, we decreased their distress. Remember the MSAS? How much does this distress you? From patient symptoms. So we were very happy about that. And we improved their quality of life. So we had some significant uh, changes as a result of this intervention. It didn't change their coping style. And I, I need to go back someday and really spend some time with that data because I'm, I'm kind of down on the brief cope, but other people use it successfully, so I think it just must be me. Very possible. But what about the patients? What did we learn about patients? Well, <clears throat> uh, the average age of the patient was about 70, 70, 71 years, and that's been very consistent in all the studies I've done in hospice. Uh, they were mostly males, caregivers mostly females, years of education. The palliative performance scale score had to be 40 or higher, and so there was a bottom cutoff. So you see that it was still fairly low given that uh, 40 was the bottom. And their mental status, they had to have a score of 8, and uh, they had an average of 8.1. We didn't find any difference in symptom intensity. We didn't find any difference in quality of life, and my initial take on that was, oh, heck, because I'm the patient person, remember? But then it dawned on me, when we got that last data point, they were 30 days closer to death, and really pretty close to death uh, by the time we took that. So obviously their symptoms are going to be worse and their quality of life, I mean, yeah, and the quality of life is going to be worse. So we were able to keep it sort of stable. That was actually a good thing. I mean, looking back, it was a good thing. But we did see a significant uh, reduction in symptom distress. So their, their intensity was not getting better, but the distress they experienced from it did, and we thought that was a real victory, at least I did. And here you see in green. Can you see it? So you can see the green line starts a little higher and goes a little lower. So we published that study, and my co-investigators were saying, oh, this is such a great thing. We need to tell everybody about COPE. Everybody ought to be using COPE. Let's send it out to all the other hospices. And um, we did have lots of requests for it from all over the world. And I don't own it, so of course I'm very happy to share anything I have. And if you contact me, I'll send it to you. Um, but I kept hearing this voice in my head that said, Single studies, never sufficient evidence. You need more than one study. And so I was not jumping out there saying, this is what everybody ought to be doing. And I was concerned that, that clinicians and hospices were taking this intervention design that we had studied with cancer patients and were using it hospice-wide. I didn't know what they were doing with it. And of course, I didn't have any right to control it, but it made me a little nervous. Um, so we did a second clinical trial. And that was in uh, 09 to 12. And that was um, supported by NINR. And we were looking at caregivers of hospice patients with heart failure. And here you see, again, our study investigators. You see some of the same names. And um, uh, again, very interdisciplinary. Cheryl Zambrowski is a qualitative researcher. You'll be happy to know that, Joan. I do know some besides you. So you might be asking yourselves, those of you who know who I am, why would an oncology nurse lead a study of patients with heart failure? And I am asking myself that same question as I stand here. Why, what was I thinking? And I'll tell you actually what I was thinking. I thought I could be a hero. Silly me. But I was thinking, you know, I, I'm now very experienced with doing hospice research, and there's really not anybody in the country who's geared up and ready to do a clinical trial with heart failure patients. And they're the next biggest group. So maybe I should think about doing it. I don't know nothing about heart failure. <laughs> but I, 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 I drew from... June Lenny's work, some of you may recognize this figure from her work she published with others in 2002. And what you see, if I can make my mouse work again, 
What you see here is the sudden death. That's somebody who like runs into somebody on the expressway and boom, they're dead. So obviously they're not going to get palliative care or hospice care. And, uh, and this is what our cancer patients sort of look like and, and other diseases. They're kind of, you know, doing pretty well, but then boom, and they start getting worse. And the organ system failure, which is kind of what I think heart failure looks like, and then the dementia frailty group. So we don't see this group. I took them out. Um, at the time we started this clinical trial, about 48% of the patients fit this picture. But the biggest growing group was the heart failure group in here. And in case you're not familiar with this, here's what happens. There, you can see there's a gradual decline here. But periodically, they have a big incident. And then we bring them back to life, and the family says, yay. And then it happens again, yay. Well, by the time they get down here, and we can't bring them back to life, the family's like, what happened? I mean, you know, you fixed them before, fix them again. So that is one of the issues. But anyway, so I was looking at these numbers and thinking, the, the number that's growing is heart failure. Somebody needs to do this. Let it be me. Bad idea. And here you just see the numbers again for end-stage heart disease. Other than cancer, it's at the top. So this, again, as I said, the study seemed very feasible. We have a huge number of patients in our area. So in our local hospice, because we limited it to one, because it was an R21. Here's my mouse. Come on. So 13% of 1,900 patients a day, 247 patients a day, piece of cake. Easily can do a clinical trial with that. Well, this is where my lack of knowledge about heart failure came in. I know a lot about oncology. Ask me. I know a lot about it. I don't know about heart failure. So patients often had had strokes, and that didn't even occur to me. When I realized it was true, when I started doing some preliminary work and interviewing patients, I went, oh, duh. You know, you do throw clots when you have bad heart. And, uh, but so a lot of them then couldn't respond to me. I couldn't uh, get data from them. And if I'm interested in looking at diet, I want to talk to the caregiver, but I want to be able to get information from the patient about the symptoms and the quality of life. They were a decade older, which I found very, very interesting, uh, than the cancer patients. Uh, our accrual goal, now bear in mind my hospice had 247 a day available to me. We wanted to get 30 in a group, a total of 60, and we ended up with a total of 40 dyads and, and then ran out of time and gave up. So an important lesson for me from this was that it was possible to revise the COPE home care guide. Uh, Dr. Harley L. Buck was my doctoral student at the time, and she was a hospice nurse who was getting her Ph.D. and was really into heart failure. Yay! me. So she helped me with the revision and identifying which symptoms were likely to occur. Cheryl Zambrowski had already defined, uh, designed a, an MSAS for heart failure, so it had the heart failure symptoms in it. Um, so um, we were able to, to adapt the COPE to heart failure and use it with this group. <clears throat> so our methods were similar to the earlier study. Um, but because Cheryl was involved with us, we added a qualitative component. And that turned out to be a really good thing. So uh, after the intervention was completed, we went to a select, we selected some of the caregivers and interviewed them and, you know, what's most, what's least helpful about this intervention. Uh, we, we didn't find any significant differences on any of the variables ever at all in the quantitative data. But the qualitative data saved the project without question. <laughs> because the caregivers told us in those interviews, very consistent data from them, what you were teaching us, we already knew. And we needed that COPE intervention years ago. One woman had been dealing with her husband's heart failure for 32 years. The average number of years had been managing symptoms was 10. We were way late bringing that intervention in. Now, the good news is that there are other researchers now who have taken that. Betty Farrell, who is the editor of the um, Journal of Hospice and Palliative Nursing, allowed us to publish the failed results, because it's hard to publish those, beside the qualitative results in the same issue so that you could see this didn't work, but here's why. And I just thought that was very generous of her to let us do that. Um, so immediately we've got three teams around the country who are looking. Uh, one is, she was at Dartmouth, now she's at Alabama, one at Emory, and one at um, Penn State. Uh, uh, Harley Abut, actually. Um, so they're moving it upstream. They're going to the places where the patients are being diagnosed and using this COPE intervention for heart failure. So I feel like, well, my study failed, but it actually had a really good outcome. I comfort myself with that when I have a bad night. <laughs> and when I say to myself, self, why did you do heart failure? So that allowed us to get some symptom data. So I always like to throw that in if I have a chance. I wish that clock were where I could see it, but I think I'm doing okay. Yeah. 
Um, so we had uh, data from both studies about the occurrence, what symptoms occurred most frequently, how severe it was, and uh, the distress. So here they are lined up, and they're lined up in the order that the cancer patients reported them, and then I just matched the symptom with the cardiac patient. So you'll see they're a little out of order, but it stars. So you'll notice that swelling is not in the cancer group, but it is in the uh, cardiac group. And so the most common were the top two were the same in both groups, which I thought was sort of interesting. Um, and then shortness of breath was a little more prevalent in uh, cardiac, not surprising, and swelling, of course. Um, and then we also happened to have some data about that same time because we were doing a clinical trial with um, patients in pain who were getting opioids because, you know, I'm the queen of constipation, and NIH saw fit to give me two and a half million dollars to study constipation. Can you imagine that? Which just continues me as the queen. I may be the empress by now. So everybody had pain in this study, so these numbers might be a little off. The fatigue would be at the top, I'm sure, if we weren't look, looking specifically at patients with pain. But again, you can see the order in which they go. The dyspnea is down at the bottom. Now, this is a group of patients who were not in hospice. They were in the cancer center being treated or being followed actively for their cancer. And so, therefore, you would expect dyspnea to be a little further down. But consistently in every study we've ever done in the hospice or in the cancer center, fatigue is number one. So here we've got some severity and distress. Now the MSAS uh, reports the severity and distress on a one to four scale. And when I try to talk to nurses about it, they don't get it because we measure things one to 10. We understand one to 10. We're sort of a one to 10 society or zero to 10. So I just converted those scores. Um, but uh, I put the, the people in here, the uh, symptoms in here that had uh, greater than 50% reported uh, by the patient. So you see that a severity and distress are not the same. For example, the pain, mean pain is 6.3, but the mean distress is higher. The mean fatigue is 6.3, but the distress from it is higher. And so there's some symptoms that are more distressing than others. And I think we're probably missing the boat because we always assess intensity, which we need to do. But I think asking the patient how distressing that is for them would be important. Uh, and I think I learned that first when we were trying to look at um, sexuality and sexual activity. And it's very important to some people and not at all important to other people. And you have more distress from things that are more important to you. So something that we need to probably move on with. OK, so the third clinical trial then is going on now. Um, and it's supported by the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, or PCORI. And when, as soon as we got funded, which happened, I guess we learned about it in May, the list came out and our name was on it. I heard from people all over the country. You got funded for PCORI? Is it different? What's it like? Tell me about it. Um, and so I was sending these long emails and finally I realized this is going to take up too much of my time. So I just started sending my um, proposal out because it was funded. So I figured nobody can steal it. Who cares? So if you need it, I'm happy to share it with you too. But we're going to approve 450 patients with cancer uh, in order to have 300 completed patients. So you can see we're expecting, a, again, a fairly high attrition rate, but not as high as with hospice. Uh, I have to say we've, we started the study and the attrition rate is not that high, so we may actually uh, have a, an even bigger sample than we expected or we may be able to stop sooner. I don't know which. But this is our moving cope upstream. So it occurred to me, if it's better to move COPE upstream for heart failure patients, why not for cancer patients? Why would I only use COPE for patients who are in the hospice who can benefit from it at the most for a month? Wouldn't it be better to move it upstream? But I also knew that if you go to a cancer patient in the cancer center and say uh, of his wife, is this your caregiver? She'll say, I'm not his caregiver, I'm his wife. Like, what? And so it's much more difficult in that situation to identify a caregiver. So we said, you know what, we really should be focusing on self-care at this point um, and letting them manage their own care. So that's uh, the direction we're taking this time. So when I realized this was an ethics center, I got a little nervous because I'm not an ethicist. I'm not, I don't have any expertise in it. In fact, I, I sat down and started trying to list ethical principles. And I thought, oh, I'm not doing very well at listing them. So I did come up with a couple. Uh, and so how is this, I'm going to just do this very quickly because I know nothing about it, but um, it's related to ethics in this way, autonomy, because what we're trying to do is teach people to take care of themselves. And so I think that probably also gets around to respect for persons. But it certainly is very important, I think, that people learn self-care so that they can feel more autonomous. Uh, I went to nursing school, you can tell by my gray hair, a long time ago when 
I was not allowed to tell patients what their blood pressure was. <laughs> well, they'd say, what is this little pink pill? And I'd say, you'll have to ask your doctor. I mean, we really couldn't tell them anything. So now we're like 180 out from that, and I'm really happy about that. Uh, and then, of course, beneficence, because we're trying to improve their conditions, and I hope that's true in any study that's ever done anywhere. So again, we have, and you'll see some familiar names on here, um, um, interdisciplinary group. Uh, Daniel Ming is the new one on, in the group, particularly, and uh, he is a healthcare economist and a wonderful addition to our campus. He's fairly new at USF, and so I've never done a costing study, so I didn't know how to do a costing study, so he came in. Because one of the things that happens with cancer patients is uh, when they have uh, an eruption of a symptom, whether it's pain or something else, it's the middle of the night or weekend or something, and they go rushing to the local uh, emergency room, which is the worst possible place for a cancer patient to go. You are not going to get your cancer pain managed adequately at a, in an emergency room. Plus, it's really expensive care. So part of the COPE intervention is to teach them what to do when a symptom erupts. Who are you supposed to call? You're supposed to call your primary nurse. Even after hours, there's somebody there to answer that phone. How do you talk to that person? That's in the book, too. So PCORI is focused on patient-centered outcomes. And um, costing is not really a patient-centered outcome so much as it is a system outcome. And so I was a little nervous about putting it in. So we put it in focusing on the fact that, although it, it's expensive, but it really is a bad quality of life move for patients, which any of us who've seen that happen know is the case. Uh, and Dr. Kodata is our palliative care. Now, you have to have uh, stakeholders who are both patients and clinicians. So Dr. Kodata is a palliative care physician at our place and at Moffitt Cancer Center, and uh, she's our, also our clinician stakeholder. Um, and I got permission to put the patient names in here because they have to be part of the project. And I said, I'm naming all of the co-investigators, and you are supposed to be part of the team, too, so may I name you? And they said, yes, of course you can. So Mary Lou Dickerson is currently dealing with metastatic breast cancer. She knows it's going to kill her someday, but not today. And she's got the most upbeat attitude she's ever had. You'd never know she'd ever been sick a day in her life. She looks wonderful. She's probably 71, 72. Sylvia Glass, we think it's probably cured, quote unquote, of her breast cancer. She's just announced to us at our last meeting that she's been five years disease free since her treatment, yay. And then Ed, Ed Gocek has a lymphoma. Um, his experience as a lymphoma patient got him excited about nursing and he went to nursing school after he was treated the first time. Uh, and he is now just dealing with uh, an exacerbation of his uh, lymphoma. But they are wonderful. Um, what did they do? Well, they, along with five other stakeholders that we had involved at the beginning, uh, reviewed our COPE video. The original COPE video was made to go with the COPE book, and it was aimed at caregivers. And it was too long. It was, I think, 45 minutes it took to go through it. And the caregivers could not focus that long. Uh, it just wore them out, and we actually had to scrap it and not use it in the first study. So we, I, on a dime, before we had the funding, made a COPE video. My son, fortunately, is a very talented um, video editor, and so he took, he made lemonade out of lemons, I guess. So it's a, it turned out to be a really nice video. <clears throat> and so they reviewed that for us and were uniformly enthusiastic, all eight of them, and that was encouraging. And then all of them read at least the introductory chapter of the home care guide. And... Um, Every person in the room said, they looked at the table of contents and they said, you've got death and dying in there. I said, yeah, it used to be in the front. I moved it to the back. They said, if I saw death and dying in the table of contents, I wouldn't read this book. I would never pick it up. Oh, okay. So that came out, which was sort of a wrench for me. <laughs> but if they won't use the symptom management information because they see that, that in there, then it's, it's not going to do any good to give them the book. So um, then the, the last three, the remaining three stakeholders who stayed with us and they were funding, we couldn't fund all eight of them because we didn't have the budget for it because we have to pay our stakeholders. So we asked three to stay, and each of those read uh, a section of the chapters. I think there were maybe 22, 23 chapters, and each one of them read and edited, sent back suggestions. One of the suggestions was I had, I used funny cartoons, you know, just to lighten the text and break it up some. And um, one of them, who apparently had lost her hair, said she didn't like that drawing <laughs> of the ball lady. That was not funny to her. So we had to find an alternative. Um, but most of the drawings they, they thought were okay. I worried about the one of people vomiting. They thought that was funny. You know, go figure. So I guess it's good I ask. So the purpose of this study is to compare the COPE intervention with usual care. 
in cancer patients who have symptoms. And this time we're looking at, they have to have symptoms that are moderate to severe. That means it's got to be at least three or higher uh, in either intensity or distress or interference. And usually if it's one, it's the others, but we'll, we'll take any one of those. Um, and so we're, we're test, sort of testing the COPE intervention with them. And then we're also going to evaluate the impact of COPE intervention on health services utilization and costs. So health services utilization, they should be using Moffitt Cancer Center. They should not be using the emergency room. And then cost is kind of tucked in, not emphasized. And here you can see some of the variables. We've used the stress process model in each of the three projects. Um, it, it's important that we make a point that we don't view patients as passive recipients of stress, but that they actively adapt to their stressors. And that's what we're trying to do is to help, help them adapt and cope. Um, so variables are here. The perceived symptom barriers, <clears throat> I added this time because there is a pain barriers measure. Some of you may know it. And so we know that patients will not take opioids sometimes for a variety of reasons. You know, what are the barriers? And one of them is I don't believe the pain can be managed. I don't want to distract my doctor by telling him I have pain, those kinds of things. But I thought probably there are other symptoms. And so we developed and validated the symptoms barriers um, questionnaire. And so it's based on the patient barriers, but it's not only about pain, it's about all symptoms. So that's uh, how that got in there. So again, it says standard care, but read, you should be reading usual care because it's not standard. Uh, and you, the same design as the original study. Now this time, we were trying to make it realistic. Um, that is more realistic in that the nurses are not going to go to the homes and do this intervention, and we're not going to have the patients come in at, at appointed times that are exactly one week apart or two weeks apart or three weeks apart. Reality is that when the oncology nurse is working with patients, she works with the patients when they show up. And some of them show up every week, some every two weeks, some every three weeks, some every four weeks for treatment. And we're using patients in treatment, so they will have to come in. So we're, we're not des designing it so that they have to come at certain intervals, but it has to be within a three to four week period. And it can be as, as little as uh, two weeks apart. And we're using radiation therapy as well as um, chemotherapy patients. And so uh, you know radiation patients come in daily. So. But, so there's a little bit of difference, but it's a little bit more realistic. So our new project began on August the 1st. Um, the staff has been identified, hired, and trained. The COPE video has been made. It was made ahead of time. Uh, and we've got the copies. Um, the home care guide is edited and printed. And we've already had one patient who, although he was told it was a reference, read through front to back the whole thing and then sent me a list of edits for it. <laughs> Unfortunately, in order to get a good price, I had to have, the, have them all printed at once. So I can't fix it for this study, but I will go into the computer and fix it for, for future. It's been approved by the uh, Scientific Review Committee at Moffitt Cancer Center and by our IRB, of course. And so far, we've approved 30 patients. So we're very, we're very busy, and, and thus far, we've only had one patient a trip. We've only had one patient drop out, so that's good. All right. So I talk fast. I always do. We've got a few minutes for questions. I'm going to pick up this microphone and sit down, and if you want to ask me questions, you can do that. Oh, I see a hand. Oh, good. I thought nobody was going to be awake enough to ask a question. In, in the first clinical trial, well, actually the first two clinical trials, uh, diversity was low because uh, we have had real difficulty. I work with the, the local hospice. I've been on various committees and boards with them for years, since the 80s. And they have had repeated attempts to increase the um, intrusion, I don't know what to call it, into the uh, minority communities, and they've been singularly unsuccessful. And when they've talked to, for example, a black caregiver or a Hispanic caregiver about you know, thinking about hospice care, uh, the response is, no, no, we don't send our, our parents away. We take care of our family at home. Well, that's because everybody, including many of the nurses I know, think that hospice care happens in a place. It happens actually in a home. And so how wonderful it would be for those black families and Hispanic families who are caring for their family members at home to have the support of the hospice nurse coming to the house. But you'd have to go to them person by person to explain that, I think. So we're having a difficult time getting the message out. Thus, our uh, take on the data from the hospices, and we've used three hospices for clinical trials, uh, has been relatively white, 
with very minimal, less than 10% minorities. Um, in the cancer center, we're having a similar problem, actually, because it's a tertiary referral center, uh, so they tend to get there. They're, they're better educated. They've got insurance. They're, you know, they're, they're smart enough to know going to a cancer center is a good idea. So again, we're not getting the poor and underserved in the cancer center, and that's been one of the problems for them for all of their clinical trials. Uh, so they're actively working on changing that, and it's, it's working better in the cancer center than it is in the hospice. Yes, ma'am. I recognize you. Without question, it would. It isn't only that we're God's waiting room, and we know that you call us that. <laughs> it is that we have hospices that uh, we have, we're a certificate of need state, so you can't c bring a new hospice into a county unless the hospice that, that's there is not meeting the need. And that means 35% penetration, that is uh, servicing 35% of all deaths, meaning sudden deaths and everything, 35% of all deaths. Um, and our hospice in the county where I am is, is servicing 65% of all deaths, which is kind of amazing. So it, it's more that, I think, than the fact that, because uh, I think you have plenty of patients who are near the end of life and are receiving end-of-life care. But if they're, in, if they're fragmented into hospices all over the community, somebody told me how many hospices you have today. I can't remember. It was, it was too many. <laughs> it was a lot. Um, it was not as bad as Salt Lake City. I consulted out there, and uh, they had they said they had 76 hospices in Salt Lake City. I said, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you correctly. I, I, <laughs> what? <laughs> so I think every nursing home is calling itself a hospice. But um, if you have places, you can go. Now, there are ways to work around that. Um, I just lost her name, Jean, in, out in uh, Colorado, the physician that's got the popcorn center. Tell me your last name. Yes, Jean Kuttner. She's an MD. And she has put together the Popcorn Center, and it is designed to do studies across the country. So she'll contact good-sized hospices. She's contacted several in Florida. And so we only have to collect three or four or five, maybe ten patients from our, and then send it all the data all back. And so she's being funded and getting research done in that way, um, which I think is great. So I think there are a lot of models for how you might get data when you've got your patients so broken up. But it is more challenging, no question. Yes, ma'am. Well, bear in mind, I know oncology. I don't know enough about birthing those babies, and I don't know about heart failure, so I probably know less about what you're talking about. But Assuming that they had caregivers and the caregivers are able to care for them, I think that the COPE method could work for helping the caregivers do a better job with supporting the patients. Without question, I think you could help them. I think it would take some adaptation of the, if you were trying to use the manual, to the symptoms that they're dealing with. But, yes, the COPE method, which is only the first chapter of the book, you know, the steps that you go through, uh, I think would be incredibly helpful. So I encourage you to look into it. Yes. It's actually not my trajectories. I want you to know June Lenny did that. June Lenny's wonderful. She gets the credit. Yes. Well, I've been studying cancer patients early in their, in their trajectory for a long time. And so there are fewer of, of them that have a given symptom. So dyspnea will be at 73% in advanced cancer patients and 27%. I mean, so as you would expect, as the disease progresses, the symptoms get worse. Uh, and more of them have a given symptom. But it also varies by what kind of cancer they have. Heart disease is your heart. It's that organ, and it affects all of the end organs. Um, cancer can start out in your brain, it can start in your gut, it can start anywhere, and so it's first going to 
have symptoms related to where it is. And so I think it's different in that way from uh, heart failure patients. But again, I'm not an expert in heart failure and don't want to be. <laughs> I realized I was over my head when somebody said, what are those devices they have that like stimulate their heart? Uh, yeah, you know, whatever that thing is. So, and they said, now what are you going to do about these patients? Are, are they going to be able to have these or that be turned off? And I went, I don't know. <laughs> Help. So, um, yeah, that's the, the day I decided I needed to finish my heart failure study and move back to oncology. I freely admit my limitations. Any other questions or comments? Don't you love it when they let you out early? Thank you so much for coming. It was